welcome. First of all, welcome. This is Unsolicited Perspectives. I'm your host, Bruce Anthony, here to lead the conversation in important events and topics that are shaping today's society. Join the conversation and follow us wherever you get your audio podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch our video podcast. Rate, review, like, comment, share. Share with your friends, share with your family. Hell, even share with your enemies. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about Republicans, some still spreading misinformation. Then we're going to be talking about the current hurricanes that are hitting the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida. And then we're going to be talking about fat bears. Don't worry, I'll explain. But that's enough of the intro. Let's get to the show. So we're not done with some, I'll give Republicans credit, some Republicans, not all of them, a large quality, a large segment of the Republican population is actually combating against misinformation. But which particular misinformation am I talking about? Am I talking about election denial? Because, you know, a lot of them still ain't fighting that. No, I'm talking about misinformation when it comes to these hurricanes. Let me explain. So Biden yesterday had to address Marjorie Taylor Greene, who continually goes in on this controlling of the weather. Y'all know me and my sister talked about it. And Marjorie Taylor Greene believes that the government can control the weather. So this is all credit from NBC News. On NBC News, President Joe Biden delivered a stark warning Wednesday about the dangerous hurricane barreling towards Florida. He shot down misinformation about the storm, including one particular conspiracy theory propagated by Republican Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene. Biden said, Marjorie Taylor Greene, the congresswoman from Georgia, is now saying the federal government is literally controlling the weather. We're controlling the weather. It's beyond ridiculous. It's so stupid. It's got to stop. Even one of Green's GOP colleagues, Representative Carlos Gimenez of Florida, wrote in response on X Wednesday morning, humans cannot create or control hurricanes. Anyone who thinks they can needs to have their head examined. It doesn't matter that Biden and even GOP colleagues are saying, yo, the government doesn't control no weather. It's not no weather wizard. When, like, why, why would the government do this in the first place? Well, she contended in a previous ex post that it was because they were trying to manipulate the election. And uh, okay, you know, the conspiracy theory theorist in me says, well, the government can, you know, can and has manipulated elections before. But we're talking about controlling the weather. But once again, that was something that she posted last week, but she doubled down this week. This is what she said. Well, some of them are listed on the NOAA site, as well as most of the ways weather can be modified because they are required to report it to the Secretary of Commerce by the Weather Modification Act of 1972. She posted this on Twitter. What she's referring to when she's talking about the NOAA is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. She continues, the NOAA government website has a library catalog of 1,026 entries of weather modification, but that's not all of them. She even continues by saying this, if your family or business or property is damaged, or a loved one is killed by their weather modifications, she said by their weather modifications, shouldn't you be eligible for compensation? After all, did they ask you if you agreed to, to, to our weather being modified? Who is she, J.G. Wentworth? Do you, do you are eligible for compensation? What the hell is she talking about? This is an elected official that's out here believing as my sister said, some gargamel up on the top of a mountain that has this we the weather nader that's controlling the weather and then doubles down for idiot people who believe this type of thing because, believe me, there are people out there that believe this. 
are now going to try, but mark my words, they're going to try to sue the government for compensation because they believe that the government has controlled the weather and created these hurricanes. <sighs> okay, 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 okay. Biden continued on to respond because he has to, because this is a representative that has a big megaphone that's spreading misinformation. This is what he said. Green's conspiracy theory was among the reckless, irresponsible, and relentless promotion of disinformation and outright lies over the last few weeks. The president said that it is undermining rescues in the wake of Hurricane Helene. And he accused former Donald, former President Donald Trump of leading the onslaught of lies. Hey, remember, Trump got a whole other group of lies that he's got going on with FEMA and weather and all this other type of stuff, right? This isn't even the Marjorie Taylor Greene stuff, which is bad in and of itself. But you have a person who is running for to become the president of the United States again that is spreading baseless and reckless conspiracy theories. Biden continued, assertions have been made that property is being confiscated. That's not true. He said, they are saying people impacted by these storms will receive $750 in cash and no more. That's simply not true. They're saying the money is needed for these crises is being diverted to migrants. What a ridiculous thing to say. It's not true. True. So, in summation, not all, but some of the prominent Republicans are spreading misinformation to people who are believing it like they believe the big lie. And it's hindering the process of saving people and getting help to the people that need help that's been devastated due to not one, but two hurricanes. You know, everybody on the show, I mean, everybody that's listening and watching the show knows I'm a huge fan of Superman. Typically, you'll even see me with a Superman shirt on. Today, I don't have a Superman shirt underneath the sweatshirt. It's a Macho Man Randy Savage shirt. Shout out to Macho Man Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth. But in the story of Superman, Krypton is destroyed. There's several different variations of why Krypton is destroyed. But the basic premise is they've used all their natural resources. The planet is dying. And there are people that won't believe Superman's father, Jor-El, that the planet is dying. That's the reason why he sends his only son to Earth, because he realizes the planet is dying and nobody is listening. And you know what happens as soon as he sends his, his son to Earth? The planet explodes because people were too stupid to listen. I'm going to get into the hurricanes in the second segment. But people are too stupid and they listen to misinformation instead of listening to the truth. You've got doctors out here and experts in their field and you do a Google search and think that you can combat anything that these experts are saying. You're not smart enough. Sorry. You're not smart, smart enough because you don't have enough knowledge on what the hell you're talking about. But you think you do. And now you're causing issues to those people that need help because you're spreading misinformation and you have elected officials both Republican and Democrats that are having to come out and say, yo, stop believing these lies on social media. It's hindering the process. We're trying to get help to people and help people. Stop calling at the office asking us if we're still in lithium from Chimney Rock. People are stupid as hell. But you know what, though? You know who, who these group of people are led by? They're led by one man, Donald Trump. And I'm not done getting on Donald Trump because Donald Trump is claiming that Kamala Harris's 60 minute interview was heavily edited. I, you might not know what I'm talking about, but Kamala Harris did an interview on 60 minutes that aired. She's been doing a lot of interviews lately to get her policies out there because I still had people to come. I had a gentleman yesterday come and talk to me. He was like, I don't know what she stands for. I was like, she's got a website. She's going to website. 
Just go on the website. That's all you got to do. Where's the website? Literally just type in her name and her website pops right up and they'll have a whole list of her policies. Who Will that be what she actually does? I don't know. We always have to take politicians for what they say that they're going to do. Do you believe what Donald Trump is going to say that he does? Because he said that he's going to do some things and then lie or those things didn't get done. I don't even know why this, I don't even know why this is a decision. People are so stupid. I swear, the older I get, the less filter I have. And I'll just point, I'll just tell you straight to your face, you dumb as hell. I do it to people all the time. And, you know, I don't think I'm better than anybody, but I damn sure know that I'm smarter and more intelligent than a lot of these people out here. But anyway, this is courtesy of the Huffington Post. All this information I'm about to give you, give you is courtesy of the Huffington Post. So what did Donald Trump say? The former president, Donald Trump, has alleged without offering any supportive evidence, which is, you know, typically his MO, that the vice president, Kamala Harris, interview with CBS News 60 Minutes was grossly sliced and diced. Those are his words, grossly sliced and diced to make her look more presidential and coherent when answering questions. Huh. Look, uh, it was edited to make her look more coherent and presidential when answering questions or, or she could just be presidential and coherent. That seems like there's more logical, but he didn't stop there. In a true social post earlier Wednesday, November 9th, the Republican president nominee, Donald J. Trump said, Harris's answers were virtually incoherent and edited these are, tr these are Trump's words that they're in the virtually incoherent and edited. But he did say before that her answers were coherent and more presidential. But what he's trying to say is, is that her answers were incoherent and, and were edited to make her seem coherent. Th these are his words. These are his words on his truth social. He says as many as four times in a single sentence or thought that there were cuts and edits to make her seem more coherent and presidential. Without explanation, he went on to say that the alleged editing could be a major campaign violation. These are, once again, his words on Truth Social. The public is owed a capitals, all capital letters, by the way, major and immediate apology, exclamation point. This is an open and shut case and must be investigated starting today. This is what he wrote on this true social. If it's an open and shut case, why must it be investigated? If it's open and shut, then it's pretty clear. So why does it need to be investigated? Uh, I, I don't, trying to understand what the hell Trump means when he says the things that he says makes my brain hurt. Because I don't, okay. However, of course, when news organizations reached out to the campaign and him, he didn't want to respond back. He didn't want to say nothing. And this is all coming after he canceled his 60 minute interview because uh, he was going to be fat checked. It, it, if a person, if, if a person is telling you a story and then other people in the vicinity of when he, where he's telling you a story, know the story as well. And they are interjecting to say, no, that's not what happened. And that person says, hey, don't fact check me. Are you going to believe what that person is telling you happened in that story? Or are you going to be like, well, wait a minute. If they were there as well, why can't they fact check you? I mean, they're saying that what you're saying didn't happen. Why should I believe you and not them? He's literally saying, and this was, you know, Vance saying at the debate, I thought we weren't going to be fact checking here. What that is saying. And, and, and some people that are backers of them will try and make excuses. But what is clear is what they're saying when they're like, I don't want to be fact checked is I'm about to lie to you and I don't want to be called out on my lie. That's what they're saying. Can you think of any other logical explanation of why you wouldn't want to be fact? Check, not fat check, because nobody wants to be fat checked, right? Don't nobody want you coming up to do and pinching your stomach. That's called fat checking. That's, that's rude. F-A-T checking, that's rude. Don't do that, right? But fat, F-A-C-T checking, what's a fat 
or or fiction, right? Like fact or fiction, true or false, as they say, right? What's real and what's fake. Don't you think you should be called out on that? So he declined to do the 60 Minutes interview because he didn't want to be fact checked. And oh, by the way, he thought that he was feet treated unfairly during the 2020 interview and decided he wasn't going to do it. Also, he decided, even though CNN has said, hey, we'll put y'all both up and we can do a second debate. He's also declined to do a second debate. You know what's scary? Is I don't know if he believes what he says or not. But if he does believe what he says, he has this weird, over-exaggerated idea of himself. The reason why Kamala Harris looks more presidential and coherent is because she is, and he is not. Plain and simple. We know that he's not coherent. He likes to say that he weaves. Look, I'm somebody who actually legitimately wheezed. If you listen to the show and you watch the show, you know that I have a topic. I go all around and I bring it all back. That's the teacher in me, right? To go and take you down these different roads, to get you to think about different things and to bring it all back to a point. But there's a plan to that. There's a method to my madness. When I turn on this microphone and start speaking, yes, I don't have a script, right? I have an idea of where I'm going with everything. And sometimes I may get off topic, routinely happens with me and my sister, but I bring it all back to a point. The main point that I was trying to make, that's what he's talking about with his so-called weaving, but he doesn't do that. They ask him a question about fracking and he's talking about, we're going we gonna to do tariffs. The truth is, what? If, I, if you ask me who won the basketball game and I'm talking to you about uh, asteroids, <laughs> right? Because like that's how, that's how so far off the subject he could be sometimes. You'll be like, Bruce, what the hell are you talking about asteroids? I asked you about the basketball game. Yeah, but did you know about these asteroids? You're going to think, maybe I'm special. <laughs> And, and not in a good way, right? Maybe I'm special if I do something like that. He's not coherent, and he's damn sure not presidential, and he hates the fact that this black woman is more coherent and presidential than he is. You know what? Not all Republicans are like this. They were once a whole group of solid Republicans. Didn't necessarily agree with them on policy, but they had reasonings for the reason why they believed a certain way. They thought that this way was the best way for America. And you know what? If you can back that up, even though I might not agree with you, I'll respect you. When all you're doing is saying that your opponent is not intelligent, not coherent, but yet you are exhibiting those very things, I have no respect for you. And for those people that are voting for him, because I had to shut somebody down yesterday who was talking about they were voting for him. I said, cool, you can, this is a free country. You can vote for exactly whoever you want. That's our democracy. However, there is nothing in our democracy, constitution or anything otherwise that says that I have to associate with you. I don't associate it. I don't associate with stupidity and ignorance. And therefore I won't be. So I guess I just won't be, you know, dealing with half the population in America. That's okay. Because for most of my life, half the population in America didn't want to deal with me anyway. And they even had laws to try to make sure that they didn't have to deal with me. We're not going back. That's what she says. And I'm with her. And if you want to ride with him, cool. It's a free country. But you're dumb as hell. <laughs> That's my unsolicited perspective that I'm just giving to you. You even want listening and watching the show. You knew what I was going to say. You knew where I was going. But anyway, it's so funny that we're talking about the hurricanes and the weather wizard and we weather nader and controlling the weather and the government has control over the weather that I'm going to talk about the hurricanes. 
But I'm going to talk about how climate change and environmentally, environmental sustainability are deeply connected with the hurricanes. And I'm going to get into that next. So we've had some for real hurricanes. Helena and Milton have been tearing us up over the last couple of weeks. And unserious people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Donald Trump will say that the government is controlling the weather that's causing these hurricanes. But in actuality, climate change and, environment and environmentally sustainability are what's deeply connected with the frequency of these intense extreme weather events, including these last two hurricanes. So you thought I was just going to talk about the hurricanes. I am going to talk about the hurricanes, but more importantly, I'm going to talk about climate change. Now, some people listening to this are like, Bruce, another lesson. Yes. I'm going to teach another lesson. Just like I did a couple of weeks ago when I was talking about childhood trauma. And then when I gave a history lesson on the Republican party, yes, I'm a teacher at heart. That's what I do. Okay. So I'm going to try in my very best way to teach the importance of climate change and how this is affecting us, right? And then I'm gonna give, give you the raw facts and then I'm gonna give you several analogies. I got six of them. I got six analogies that will hopefully simplify the complicated subject of climate change. All right, so how are, com how are it's complicated, how is, how complicated is this? It's very complicated, so complicated, I can't even get the words out right. Okay. How connected are is climate change and hurricanes? Well, we have warmer oceans now. What does that mean? Climate change has led to a rising sea surface temperatures, which provide more energy for hurricanes, making them stronger and more destructive. Basically, warmer waters can increase the intensity of storms, leading to higher wind speeds and more rainfall. We also have rising sea levels. As global temperatures rise, you know, because last summer was the hottest summer of all record and next summer will be the hottest summer on record, right? So as global temperatures rise, polar ice melts and sea levels increase. Higher sea levels contribute to more severe storm surges and coastal flooding during hurricanes. It also leads to increased rainfall. A warmer atmosphere holds more, holds more moisture, leading to heavier rainfall during storms. This can result in significant flooding, as seen with the recent hurricanes, Helena and Milton. But let's specifically talk about the hurricanes Helene and Milton. Hurricane Helene made a landfall as a category four hurricane, causing widespread destruction across multiple states. The storm's intensity and resulting damage were exasperated by the warmer ocean temperatures and higher sea levels. Hurricane Milton recently was downgraded to a category one storm, so that was good, but initially made landfall as a category three. Milton was called has caused significant flooding and power outages affecting millions of people. The, storm, the storm's impact highlights the ongoing challenges posed by climate change. All right, that's climate change, right? What about environmental, environmental sustainability? Addressing climate change through sustainable practices is crucial to mitigating the impact of such extreme weather events like the two hurricanes that we just had. So it's not the government controlling weather, sort of, not with some weather machine to create hurricanes, but it's our policies and the things that we do as people in the world that are causing these things. How can we help? We can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, transitioning to renewable energy sources, improving energy efficiency and adopting sustainable transportation can help reduce emissions that contribute to global warming. We can enhance resilience by 
Building resilient infrastructures, improving early warning systems, and implementing effective disaster response plans can help communities better withstand recovery from hurricanes. I don't know, like building the infrastructure better and maybe funding FEMA better. Maybe Republicans shouldn't vote down increasing money for FEMA. I don't know. Maybe that's just a thought. Also, we need to protect our natural ecosystems. Preserving wetlands, mangroves, and natural barriers can reduce the impact of storm surges and flooding. These hurricanes cause a lot of flooding. By understanding the link between climate change and extreme weather events, we can take informed actions to promote environmental sustainability and protect vulnerable communities. Look, this topic not only raises awareness, but also encourages proactive measures to address the root causes of climate change. Now, I gave you all that. And maybe your eyes glossed over like you're back in school and your teacher or professor is giving you a lecture and they're just saying big words like environmental sustainability and greenhouse effect. And you're like, Bruce, what the hell does all this mean? Like I said at the beginning, I got six analogies to make it easier for you to understand. The first analogy is athletes and steroids. Y'all know about athletes and steroids. There are still some people in baseball that should be in the Hall of Fame that's not in the Hall of Fame because they were suspected of steroids because steroids do what? Supposedly enhance their abilities. Okay, so what is the correlation? How can you make this analogy, Bruce? Don't worry, I'm gonna get there. Climate change as a performance enhancer for hurricanes. Imagine a hurricane just as an athlete. Under normal conditions, this athlete trains and competes at a certain level. However, when you introduce performing enhancing substances like steroids, the athlete becomes stronger, faster, and more powerful. This is similar because climate change acts like a performance enhancer for hurricanes. You need more examples? Don't worry about it, I got you. Warmer oceans, right? Warmer oceans. Just as steroids increase an athlete's muscle mass and strength, warmer ocean temperatures provide more energy to hurricanes, making them stronger and more intense. Increased moisture. Climate change causes the atmosphere to hold more moisture. Similar to to how an athlete on steroids can perform more intense workouts. This extra moisture leads to heavier rainfall during hurricanes. What about higher sea levels? Remember, this is all part of the intensity of extreme weathers that have led to things like Hurricane Helene and Milton. Rising sea levels driven by climate change are like giving an athlete a better starting position. This makes storm surges more severe, just as a better starting position can give an athlete an advantage in the race. It seems like y'all still not getting it. Well, okay, let's see if these other analogies can connect. Okay, let's, let's try this. Think of the earth as being wrapped in a blanket. This blanket is made up of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. Normally, the blanket keeps us warm enough to live comfortably. You know, we're snuggling on the couch or in the bed, watching Netflix, binging Netflix, probably got some tequila, maybe tequila, champagne, popcorn, some snacks, something. You're wrapped up in your blanket and you're feeling comfortable, right? Okay. However, as we burn fossil fuels, we add more layers to that blanket, trapping more heat and making Earth too warm. So kind of like, you know, when you land in the bed or on the couch and you keep adding more and more blankets and then you overhear at the night. I know I have had many a girlfriend spend the night. They get hot because y'all be getting, y'all run weird. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that y'all are weird or anything, but just temperature. You know, y'all, y'all run hot a lot of times and you run cold sometimes. Y'all run cold and hot. I don't really understand women, even though I love y'all so very, very much. But there have been a lot of times that a young lady, excuse me, mama, a young lady has been spending the night in my bed, right? And I sleep with a comfort a year round, but I also got fans blowing all over the place. And it's too hot for them. And they kick the covers off of them, off of themselves because it's too hot. 
This is the same thing as the greenhouse gases, right? Eventually, if we don't get control of this, this earth is going to get hotter and hotter and they're going to kick the legs out, kick the legs out, kick the covers off. The only problem is kick the covers off ain't going to make us cooler. It's going to cause a major problem. Are y'all understanding now? I still see some people in the back that don't quite understand. That's okay. I got more analogies. I told you I had six. Okay, so imagine a bathtub with a water running. If the drain is partially blocked, it's all we've all had that before. If a, if a drain is partially blocked, this represents the natural process of the planet removing CO2, carbon dioxide, okay? The water level, the CO2 in the atmosphere will rise, right? If we keep adding water or similarly, burning fossil fuels, eventually the bathtub will overflow, causing a mess. This is the same thing as adding too much CO2 to the atmosphere will lead to climate change and messy consequences. You see, you see what I'm saying with the overflowing bathtub? Y'all not hearing me. Y'all not hearing me. Okay, 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 okay. I got this one. I got this one. Consider the earth as having a fever. We all had a fever out there, right? Just like the human body, the earth has a natural temperature range. When it gets too hot, it can cause problems. Climate change is like earth running a fever, which can lead to severe symptoms like extreme weather, melting ice caps, and raising sea levels. So think of it as you got a fever because you're sick, and then your nose start running, your throat start hurting, you start coughing, stomach is queasy. All that stuff, yeah, that's the same as extreme weather and melting ice caps and rising sea levels. <sighs> y'all still not getting it. Okay, okay, okay. Some of y'all still not getting it. I'm going to give a couple more analogies. Maybe y'all get this. Okay. Think of the earth as a garden. If you over fertilize it, adding too many greenhouse gases, right, the plants or the climate systems can become unhealthy. They might grow too fast, wilt, or even die. Similarly, too much CO2 disrupts the natural balance leading to climate change. Are y'all getting it now? Are y'all getting what I'm kicking out? Do y'all understand what I'm saying? All right, okay, look, for all my adults out there that are driving, this last analogy, this one should hit you. Okay. Imagine the atmosphere as a highway, right? We all been on the highway. Normally cars, in this scenario, talking about climate change, cars represent heat, can move freely, right? But if there are too many cars, which would mean greenhouse gases, traffic jams occur, trapping the cars and causing delays. Similarly, excess greenhouse gases trap heat in the atmosphere, leading to global warming. Look, I can't make it no simpler than that. This is a serious issue. And the reason why we're having these hurricanes is because of climate change, global warming. I just broke it down for you. But, you know, there's some people out there that are just going to believe what they want to believe. And, and it's really... The reason why they believe like they want to believe is the very same reason why I don't want to give up Diddy. I'll explain. See, giving up Diddy means I can't listen to music anymore. Trying to combat climate change means that we got to give up some stuff that we really enjoy. Combating climate change requires a combination of individual actions, policies, policy changes, and technological advances. What do I mean by individual actions? These are the things that hit us all close to home, such as reduce, reuse, and recycle. By minimizing our waste, by recycling and reusing products, we reduce consumption, which helps lower the demand for new products, which in turn reduces greenhouse emissions. But you understand why people would combat that, right? Our whole economy is based on waste and attaining. If we're hoarding and not spending money and not getting new products, it'll damage the economy. That's the reason why people are against 
climate change. It messes up the pocket. Look, the majority of the people in this country, I've learned, especially as I got older, vote on their pocketbook. Money is what's important to them. Even these so-called Christians, money is the number one thing that's important to them. Not the values, not the morals, the money. And I get it. Money is like, we kind of need it. And life is expensive. And we do need to stimulate the economy. So I understand why they would say, you know, I don't want to deal with climate change. It's the same reason why I don't want to watch the Michael Jackson documentary. I don't want that to take away my feel good. My, a lot of these people there feel good is being able to have money and go and do things. And the only way that that happens, we have a stable economy. It's selfish. It's self-centered. It's also real. I don't know what the right answer is, but what is the difference of having a whole bunch of money? You can't take it with you. That's what I always tell people. You can't take it with you. What's the difference if you have all this money and all these resources and all this comfort? If the world is burning. All right. What are some other individual actions? Energy efficiency. Use energy efficient appliances and light bulbs and insulate your home to reduce energy consumption. Simple actions like turning off lights when not in use can make a big difference. Now, I have energy efficient products. I have energy efficient lights. I, however, have my lights all on with different colors. It's, that's taking up a lot of energy, and I know it is because my utility bill is ridiculous for a one-bedroom, one-bath place. It, it's absurd. I spend sometimes as much as a house because I got video games and TVs on. I need to do a better job as well. I'm not just attacking other people out there. I'm attacking myself. Like I need to do a better job as well. But uh, just to let y'all know, I've been recycling since I was in my twenties. Recycling is cool, but you know, you need other stuff as well. Sustainable transportation. Now I have personally taken this on. Opting for walking, cycling, public transportation, or even electric vehicles instead of driving fossil fuel power cars, carpooling, and reducing air travel also help in lowering our carbon footprint. This is another one. This next one is another one that's hard for me to deal with. And it's dietary choices. Eating a plant-based diet or reducing meat consumption can significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions associated with livestock farming. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going on no plant-based diet. Like that's not going to happen. I've gone into a couple of vegan restaurants. First of all, they're expensive as hell. That's number one. Number two, it's all right, but not all right all the time. It also says you can reduce your meat consumption. What is reducing? I'm a 200 and actually 30 pound man, you know, cause I cut some LBs down. I'm a 230 pound man. In order to sustain my muscle mass, I had to at least consume 150 grams of protein a day. You know how much meat that is? I don't like to eat beans. You know, beans is a, you know, a bodily instrument and when you eat beans. And, that, and I, y'all know, know what I'm talking about. I don't want to do that. But once again, these are selfish reasons. And that's what I'm trying to get to you. Look, I'm an example of somebody who, who doesn't do certain things that could help our environment for selfish reasons. I am not singling out anybody. I'm talking to all of us collectively because these hurricanes and what people are facing is real. This is real life. As Master P would say, this is real life. This is reality. And there are some things that we need to do in order to make a better life, not just for us, but for future generations. And we need to also, for our last individual action, support renewable energy. If possible, switch to green energy providers that use renewable sources like wind, solar, or hydroelectric power. There's some other things that we could do, and it's called policy and advocacy. What we all should be doing is being politically engaged, advocating for policies that promote renewable energy, energy efficiency, and carbon reduction should all be on our plate. We should support the leaders and initiatives that prioritize climate action. There's also corporate responsibility. 
encourage businesses to adapt sustainable practices and reduce their carbon footprints, support companies that com are committed to environmental sustainability. Remember I said that earlier, environmental sustainability? Yeah. We need to back the companies that are actually trying to promote that. And we also need international co uh, cooperation. We need to support global agreements and collaborations aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions, such as the Paris Agreement. And I know sometimes we don't really rock with the French like that, but that Paris Agreement, <laughs> that Paris Agreement is all right. We also need to keep on with the technological advances. Renewable energy, right? Wait, I said it earlier, we must invest and support the development of renewable energy technologies like solar, wind, and geothermal power. These sources produce little to no greenhouse emissions. Now, granted, power companies are a huge lobbyist out there, and they don't want to lose their power, coal, all these things, all the fossil fuels that we use, all these things. They have a huge political muscle. They're also destroying this planet. Carbon capture and storage support technologies that capture and store carbon dioxide emissions from industrial processes and power plants and agriculture promote sustainable farming practices and technologies that reduce emissions from agriculture, such as precision farming and methane capture. Now, if y'all want to know what those are, go ahead and look that up. They were real complicated. And I don't know if I could have came up with an analogy that could explain it better. But I will say sometimes our farming, like when I said when we need to reduce our, our, our you know, meat consumption and go to plant-based, not completely go to plant-based, but just reduce our meat consumption. It, yeah, livestock farming is, is a key ingredient to greenhouse gas blowing up. Not technically blowing up, but becoming a problem here on this planet. We also need to be educated, right? As evident by Marjorie Taylor Greene and a lot of people that are anti-climate change, okay? Educate others about the impacts of climate change. That's what I'm doing right now. And the importance of taking action. That's also what I'm doing right now. You gotta use social media. I guess this would be on social media. Community events and educational programs to spread the word and participate in in, in or support local environmental projects such as tree planting, community gardens, and cleanup drives. Look, by combining these efforts, we can make significant progress in combating climate change and protect our planet for future generations. Because isn't that what it's all about? The future generations, even if you don't have kids, because I don't have kids, right? I don't, but I got nieces and nephews and cousins that are going to have kids that I care about and I love. We all have people that are going to be in the next generation that we love. And I know we think it's so far down the road, but it's not. Like, if we don't get a handle on this, we're going to destroy the planet, relatively rapidly. So wouldn't we want to give the next generation the same or better opportunity than us? I would assume that we would want to give them better opportunities than us. But at the very least, wouldn't we want to give them the same? I don't know. That's just my thought. But every action counts. And together, together, we can create a more sustainable and resilient world for the future, for the kids. Even if you don't like kids, you don't want nothing bad to happen to kids. I know you don't because we are all for the kids. We are all for feeding them and taking care of them. So stop thinking about ourselves. And I'm including me in that. Stop being so selfish. Do a little bit. Even a little bit can go a long way. Y'all know I like learning. I like learning about things that are interesting to me. I didn't I never had trouble in school. I was just often bored in school. Because certain things just weren't interesting to me. You know what's really not interesting to, uh, interesting to me? Geometry. Nothing about it is interesting to me. You know what isn't? What also isn't? Trigonometry. 
chemistry was kind of cool. Biology, I guess, was kind of dope. Um, geology, not interested at all. Astronomy, not as fun as I thought it was going to be. But the world at large, history, oh, I love it. Learning can be fun. And it was interesting because this week I came across something that was really dope and a learning experience. And I'm talking about fat bears. You need me to give you more detail? I got you covered. Don't worry about that. There's an annual fat bear wheat contest in Alaska's Kitimai National Park. Don't quote me on that. It's, it's Katamai or Kitimai. It's Alaska's National Park, okay? It's an annual celebration. Fat Bear Week is held every October at the National Park in Alaska. I'm not going to try to say that name again. It celebrates brown bears' impressive weight gain as they prepare for winter hibernation. There's a public voting situation. The event features a tournament-style competition where the public can vote online for their favorite bears based on their size and weight gain. The bear with the most votes is crowned the Fat Bear Week champion. Why was I drawn to this? Because of the educational aspect of it. Throughout the week, virtual visitors can learn about the bears' lives and ecosystem of the National Park through live events and educational content hosted by Explore.org. So, <laughs> Trump says that he weaves. I'm weaving here. Are y'all following where I'm going with this? As I talked about climate change before, and now I'm talking about Fat Bear Week and how this particular instance gives an education on the ecosystem and why bears hibernate. Like, the, we're all connected in this earth. You know, I often say, why the hell do we need spiders? Well, we do need spiders. Spiders have, they fit in the ecosystem because they eat certain things. We need mice because they eat certain things. We even need roaches because they take care of certain things. Everything is connected. Whatever we do is connected to the next person, even if it's not directly. It could be indirect. So it's so cool to learn about things that you never really think of that's connected to us and why it's so important to learn about the bears' lives and the ecosystem. Because climate change, as I said earlier, is melting the polar ice caps. You know who that's affecting? Polar bears. Go look at some of these videos where these polar bears are malnourished and skinny and they're dying off. It's all related to climate change. So these type of things like Fat Bear Week are good education, especially for kids, because it puts it in a fun atmosphere. You're going to vote tournament style to see which bear is going to be the chubbiest before they get the hibernation. Now, you tell anybody out there now that didn't know about this, because I didn't know about that until this week. Now, I want to participate in Fat Bear Week, and I want to learn about bear hibernations. Look, y'all pay attention to Shark Week. Y'all watch Shark Week. Y'all watch Animal Planet all the time. You know you're interested in, in animals and, and the, the, the jungle and the kingdoms and all that stuff. People still cry because uh, Mufasa fell off that damn rock. You still crying off of that. All that, st all that stuff is connected. Learning is fun, ladies and gentlemen. That's what I'm basically trying to say. Learning is fun. <laughs> anyway, um, of course, because there's voting and there's interaction, some of these bears become famous. I, I dig these names. Some bears like 32 Chunk. Now, you can't call no person 32 Chunk, but you can call a fat bear 32 Chunk. 32 Chunk and 128 Glazer. Now, I don't know like why they came up with that name. That name is kind of weird. 32 Chunk, I kind of dig. 128 Glazer, I'm not feeling that name. But anyway, have become fan favorites over the years. Each bear has a unique story and personality, making the competition more engaging. It's a trick to get people to learn and to understand how the environment and the things that we do affect not only us, but other living organisms out there. There are conservation e efforts. This is, what I, this is another thing that I really dug besides the educational aspect of it. Fat Bear Week also highlights the importance of conservation. 
The events raise awareness about the bear's habitat and the challenges they face, encouraging support for the national park and its wildlife. You know, like challenges that they face just because we keep doing ill stuff, man. <laughs> like we're affecting things out there all because you want to drive your super SUV. All right. I mean, F F 150s do look cool, but I'm just saying, I think they got some electric ones now. I think don't quote me on that. I don't know. What's also dope that I learned this week is this is a, this is a global participation. So people from all over the world participate in fat bear week, making it truly a global event and a great way to connect with nature and learn about wildlife conservation in a fun and interactive way. Why did I bring this story up? One, I thought it was in a, I thought it was interesting. Right. And I just love, I want to continuously say fat bear week. I want to say fat bear week for the rest of my life, because I just think that's dope. But I love the fact that they took something really simple and that happens every year. Bears preparing to hibernate, right? Something so simple. And they made it a competition of who could get the chubbiest. And they brought people in and in the process of bringing people in for this simplistic competitive thing, right? Because you can always bring people in to a competitive event because we're naturally competitors, right? We naturally want to win. We want to win and want to be right. That's human nature. We want those two things. So they bring them into this competition. And in the process, they slick, they slick, they slide a little bit of that, that knowledge. Whether you realize it or not, you ain't even signed up for that. You signed up to, to, to look at fat bears. But next thing you know, you're learning about their natural habitat. You're learning about the national park. You're learning about conservation. You're learning about their environment. You're learning about why they do the things that they do. Why do they need to hibernate? Why do they need to gain the weight before they go into hibernation? You're learning. And it's a fun, dope way to teach people. That's kind of how I tried to do things with the analogies. I mean, it's not as fun as voting on a fat bear in a tournament style setting. <laughs> okay, I get that. I understand that. But me, as the heart of me, a historian and an educator, have always tried to find ways to relate what I'm trying to convey to make it understandable for you when sometimes, sometimes, when I say the words right, I'm talking about complex topics. It's easy to understand a complex topic when you can make it relatable to you. The relatableness of Fat Bear Week is just a tournament. It's just competitiveness. And then maybe if you have kids, you bring your kids in to look at the bears. Like who doesn't love bears from a distance? From a damn distance. Who doesn't love bears? And don't like looking about and learning about them. Everybody loves to learn about bears, right? So maybe if you got kids, you bring your kids in and then your kids learn something and have, I'm going to ask a lot of my parents out there, how often do your kids bring something home from school that they study or something like that? And you got to help them with their work and you learn something new and you're like, oh, that's pretty cool. Maybe you might jump on the Google machine, type it in, learn more about it. I often do that when I'm watching a movie or TV show or reading an article or jump on the Google machine to learn more about it. I fall down these rabbit holes. Cause I'm a nerd and I like learning and we all like learning. We just like learning about things that we want to learn about, but they tricked you into learning about fat bears by producing a tournament to judge the bears based on them gaining weight. And in the process, you don't not only learn about the bears, but you also learn about their environment. I tricked y'all by saying I was going to talk about the hurricanes and I did but I talked about the hurricanes in relation to climate change and how that's affecting us as a whole. And you really can't deny the oceans are getting warmer. The earth is getting hotter. Storms are becoming more and more extreme. That's just the case. Like that's just the stone cold facts. And there are some things that we can do, even if we don't like them to change that. Well, I don't know if we can reverse it. 
we can slow the process down a little bit. We can do that. I don't know how far we can slow it down, but we can slow it down a little bit. And yeah, it ain't going to be easy. Nothing in life is easy. Nothing that's worth anything in life is easy. But in that, the beauty, when you do something, when you set a goal, you set a challenge and you accomplish it, knowing that it wasn't easy, but you were determined to reach that goal, to conquer that challenge, and you did it. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. So look, ladies and gentlemen, I'm never going to stop teaching. I'm never going to stop challenge y'all to learn because I don't stop challenging myself to learn. And in some ways it could be super fun, like fat bear week. In other ways, it could be a lecture, like the beginning part of the segment of climate change. And in other ways, I can create multiple analogies that can make it a little bit more digestible and understandable to you. And then I can always bring it back to our current politicians who don't believe in it, who believe in a weathernator, as my sister would say, that controls the hurricanes to hurt people. Okay. Yeah. Those people want to believe that there's not too much logic I can give them to change their mind. They're fixated on that point. But maybe, maybe some of y'all listening and watching out there, I hit a few of you. You think about it a little bit more. Maybe you go to sleep. Maybe you go and you Google Fat Bear Week. I encourage it. This was really insightful. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> but on that, Nate, on that note, ladies and gentlemen, not that Nate. I don't know what that Nate is. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for watching. And until next time, as always, I'll holler. Whew. That was a hell of a show. Thank you for rocking with us here on Unsolicited Perspectives with Bruce Anthony. Now, before you go, don't forget to follow, subscribe, like, comment, and share our podcast wherever you're listening or watching it to it. Pass it along to your friends. If you enjoy it, that means the people that you rock with will enjoy it also. So share the wealth, share the knowledge, share the noise. And for all those people that say, well, I don't have a YouTube. If you have a Gmail account, you have a YouTube. Subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can actually watch our video podcast. But the real party is on our Patreon page. After Hours Uncensored and Talking Straight-ish. After Hours Uncensored is another show with my sister. And once again, the key word there is Uncensored. Those are exclusively on our Patreon page. Jump onto our website at unsolicitedperspective.com for all things us. That's where you can get all of our audio, video, our blog blogs and even buy our merch and if you're really feeling genuine and want to help us out you can donate on our donations page donations go strictly to improving our software and hardware so we can keep giving you guys good content that you can clearly listen to and that you can clearly see so any donation would be appreciative most importantly i want to say thank you thank you thank you for listening and watching and supporting us and i'll catch you next time Audi 5000, peace.